Hello and welcome to our Q&A with our occupational therapist today, Tina Blemings from Children First. Hi, Tina. Hello, Sarah Jane. And I'm Sarah Jane. I'm a resource consultant and I will be asking the questions today that we've collected from um, some of our families that are both working with um, our agency or have just asked these questions through our Facebook and Instagram posts. So we thank you very much for participating and asking those questions. We look forward to offering more sessions like this. So if you have any questions regarding your child's development or in supporting any uh, mental wellness, you can always give our agency a call at 519-250-1850 and one of our administrative assistants will help to connect you to our intake team. So again, thanks for tuning in for our question and answer period. And this one again is around self-help skills. And um, Tina, I would like for um, you to share a little bit about occupational therapy. Sure. As an occupational therapist, I look at occupation as everything that people do in their day. So for our children, especially those little ones who are heading off to school, that's learning about their self-help skills, becoming more independent with dressing and undressing, uh, working a lot on their hand skills because we need our hands to do a lot of the occupations that we do, especially as we go to school and they're required to learn how to print their name and use scissors and manipulate some of those learning tools. That's awesome. So those are, that is one of the services that is available at uh, Children First and Tina being one of our occupational therapists has a lot of experience in helping families with um, strategies to promote these skills. So your questions today will be answered and if you feel again like you have more questions you can always get in contact with us to see if a referral to our agency would best support your family. So Tina talked about some of those dressing skills and we have some questions here Tina around oh gosh um, how can you help your child when heading off to school to know how to put the shoe on the right foot so there's a few things that you can look at so typically it's developmentally children get their shoes mixed up um, usually around four or five it starts to, they start to realize what shoe goes on what foot just by the feel or by looking at it. But things that you can do to help, um, some commercially available ideas is they have stickers that are kind of a half mood on one side and half mood on the other and together they make a whole picture. So you put them in your, the heels of your shoes. So when the child looks at their shoes, they can line them up to make the full picture. Another idea is just on the inside sole of the shoe, you can put happy face on one shoe, happy face on the other shoe, and then have them kiss before they put their shoes on. Oh, what a great idea. That's perfect. Uh, that's one that I've not heard of yet. So that's a great idea. I know that there is uh, questions about some of that, dr those dressing skills as well, like how, um, you know, how can we help our child if they don't dress themselves, like getting their coat on or getting a sweater on, you know, as the weather's going to start to turn cooler. Any ideas? For our littler kids, sometimes they do really well with the flip method. And um, so what that is, is you lay your coat on the floor, you put your arms in and you flip it up over your head. So um, before they learn how to, it's a big skill to be able to put your coat on with one, yeah, like one, one arm, arm <laughs> and bring it around. That requires a, um, a feel of the coat without being actually able to see the coat. So, um, so kids do nice with the flip method to begin with. But some of our children who might take a little bit to learn that skill or some of our children who are um, on the autism spectrum, they don't necessarily generalize skills. So if you're teaching the flip method, they might be much older, 7, 8, 10, 12, still doing that flip method. So I usually recommend that we, we um, start by the regular method or the standard way of putting a coat on. And you would use a strategy called backward chaining to help with that. So what backward chaining is, is you do the most work that a child needs and you let them do the last little bit of the task. And then you slowly back off as they become more competent. So for example, you might help the child put one arm in, bring it around their back, start their hand in that, and then they would just finish the push through. And then you would, once that's mastered, you don't want to move on before a skill is mastered, then you would maybe start by putting it sort of around their back and holding the jacket at their sweater. So then now they have to actually put their arm in 
and push it through. So it's breaking down the task a little bit. Some of our kids as well do better learning how to dress in front of a mirror, especially with those skills that you, you have to do a little bit blind if they have the mirror to get that visual feedback and can be helpful as well. Wow, that's a great, that's a great idea. I ne- again, I never thought of dressing in front of the mirror, but we often do that at home for getting ready, right? So what a great, great tip. Okay, I'm looking down at the questions here. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the, um, the other questions uh, that comes up is, do they need to be fully toilet learned before they start kindergarten in the fall or before they start school? So, Um, For many of the families that have been involved with our services, I can start off by sharing that um, in in preparing for school, we offer the service of school transition um, coordination. So we work with families in order to be in contact with the classroom teacher and the school support team um, to ensure that they have a really good understanding of what that child can do for themselves successfully and the things um, that they, be, they would need the support around. So if a child is requiring more support around toileting, we are typically able to successfully transition them off to school with where they're at. So if that is, um, you know, going to school with a pull-up on or training underwear or requiring multiple visits to the bathroom, not just, you know, um, having uh, the bathroom in the classroom, but having someone to help take them to the bathroom. We, um, we definitely help families to, to make a plan for that with their school team. So again, if, if there's questions around, um, you know, complete independence in the bathroom and whether or not they can start school. We've had lots of families and their children head off to school with uh, multiple supports in place for uh, for children learning toileting. So um, if the second part of that question is, what are the types of things that we can practice or, or to do for toilet learning? Maybe Tina, you can take it away from there. Well, the first step is creating some independence around the around the routine. So for a child to be able to pull up and down their pants, again, going back to that idea of backward chaining, really practicing um, pulling up pants. Down is usually a little bit easier and children will master that quickly. And then especially with a diaper, it gets a little bit harder to pull pants up over the diaper. Um, when you're sitting your child on the toilet, you want to make sure that they're well supported. Um, again, some of our kids just don't have the body awareness. So when they're sitting on a big hole, they kind of feel like they're maybe going to fall off. So you want to make sure you have a ring reducer, one that's actually attached into the lid of the toilet. You can find that at any hardware store is actually even nicer because it doesn't wiggle so much as the ones that you just plop in. Um, and then having, making sure their feet are well supported. So you want a stool that is big enough for the child to stand up on, turn their bodies around and sit down and still have their feet supported. Again, if they don't have anything to put their feet on and they're not quite sure where their body is in space, that gets a little bit scary. Um, so, and when they're off to school, if there are some adaptations that are needed, there's occupational therapy services that are available through the school-based rehabilitation program that John McGivney offers. So we can consult with an OT at that time so that they can look at the bathroom, make sure there's a, a safe way for the child to learn toileting. Yeah, that's some really great pointers. I also um, think in all those recommendations that you're making for the children, uh, it's the same as for us, for adults, you know, if we didn't have uh, a stable spot to sit, even if it be at the desk or in Mm -hmm. the bathroom, we wouldn't feel comfortable. So, um, you know, just putting yourself really, um, uh, you know, empathizing with the child and thinking, okay, if we were sitting on a toilet that was four times bigger than what we needed and our feet were dangling down, Oh my gosh, that was overwhelming, <laughs> right? So yeah, those Absolutely. ideas are so good. Thanks, mm-hmm. Tina. Oh my gosh, okay. Moving along to another question. A parent's asking, does a child need to be able to print their name in order to start uh, kindergarten? And if so, you know, what could they be doing to practice that skill before school? It's definitely not an expectation that a child be able to print their name. In fact, developmentally, I would expect that most children wouldn't be able to to, uh, write their name independently when they enter school. Or if they are able to write their name, I would question whether or not they could write 
other letters of the alphabet. So as opposed to just learning the letters of their name and how to draw that, can they draw other letters? The, the focus, I think, before children enter school would be on pre-printing skills. So there is a hierarchy of development that occurs um, that children start to learn some basic strokes first and then those strokes start to get integrated as a child learns how to draw letters and numbers and more complex pictures. So um, usually developing around between two and three you would start to see a child develop or be able to make horizontal and vertical lines with a distinct endpoint at either side um, and fairly straight, not angled lines. Um, circles and crosses come next and you wanna make sure when your child is drawing a cross that you actually have an intersecting line. So some kids will draw a straight line down and then out one side and out the other side, but you wanna make sure that it crosses um, because that's the, the basic um, the basic strokes that we need to write letters. So instead of focusing on the printing of the letters before your child enters school, really focus on those pre-printing skills. Otherwise, we'll start to learn what we call splinter skills so that they learn, you know, what their name looks like, but they can't generalize that into something more functional. Right, and I, and I recall too some of the advice that you've given to families that you and I have worked with in the past is, you know, start big and you can kind mm. of work your way down small. So ideas of like a bringing in, you know, some super washable paint into the, um, into the tub and, you know, making, and making some of those strokes together, you mo like you modeling as the parent and then the child having a turn to take, um, you know, uh, to take their turn in the, in the bathtub too and you got a nice big canvas in there and it also can get cleaned up real quickly and then moving down to smaller projects, right, yeah. from there. And it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be a writing utensil and a piece mm -hmm. of paper. Um, we can learn, work on pre-printing skills in different ways. A stick in sand, taking yeah. painter's tape and drawing um, car maps or roadways of crosses, baking cookies and making circles and crosses with the cookies. So, so many different ways to work on pre-printing skills because not every child loves to hold a pencil at the right. very beginning. Yeah, so true. So true. That's another, another great tip and another great question asked by one of our families. And uh, I know that um, we'll likely have some more resources that we'll be able to mm -hmm. post into the, um, the comment section of this uh, virtual post that we'll be making on our social media site. So for some of you that need more resources or would like um, some follow-up information, we'll, we'll post that underneath. And uh, we'll be back too in uh, a couple more sessions. We're going to cover some, some other school readiness skills. So I think we're gonna take a look at some self-regulation for school. Mm -hmm as well as what will, what else will we talk about Tina I think we said self regulation and then self regulation and we were talking about that core strength and stability and really yes. building that foundation of of body strength so that it makes it easier to work with your hands that's right. That's right. So if you, after watching this video, thought that these answers and this question period was helpful to you, feel free to post some more questions or send them in to your resource consultant. And uh, Tina and I will be back for another Q&A period real soon. So thank you so much again for your time today, Tina. We appreciate no you problem. and all of your advice. And again, if you yourself have some questions regarding your child's development or their ability to, um, you know, uh, do those self-help skills and you feel like a referral might be warranted for your family, feel free to give us a call at 519-250-1850 and we will um, give you the opportunity to speak to one of our excellent intake um, screeners and they will help to uh, get you sorted out with any services you might need. So. Thanks again, Tina, and thank you, everyone. Anytime. Take care. Bye. Bye.